Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so we have some people in the audience here, and we have people on Zoom. Um, so hopefully some folks in Israel wanted to join as well. Uh, so we included the Zoom option for them, and some colleagues maybe from the UK. Um, also I see Barbara from New York, so hi, Barbara. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Shimon Rice uh, to talk about the Lancet Commission on uh, medicine during the Holocaust. Um, I had the privilege of uh, getting to know Shmuel a long time ago. Uh, neither of us can remember exactly when, but it was in a different life for both of us. Um, and ever since then, we corresponded periodically. Um, and more recently, we increased our uh, back and forth. And Shmuel has been helping me or inspiring me to have my own little project here in, in Hong Kong where we take students, this is the upcoming project, where we take students to Harbin to learn about the Japanese experiments on, uh, in Manchuria, uh, on citizens, civilians in Manchuria, um, which has some similarities to what Shmuel is going to talk about today, uh, which is the experiments conducted on Jews, among others, uh, during World War II. Um, so it's my great privilege to invite uh, Shmuel to talk. So the way it's going to work is he's going to talk for roughly half an hour. Uh, obviously, it can be interactive. So if anybody wants to ask questions, uh, I will monitor the Zoom so you can ask and obviously in the audience, and then uh, we open up for general discussion. So, Shmuel. Uh, hello, can you hear us? Okay, okay, I see. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for the kind introduction, Zohar, and inviting me over. Um, some of you have been also in the former lecture, or we met before. Some just introduced themselves to me, so welcome. Um, this is go not going to be a formal lecture. I would like it to be as conversational as possible, so uh, feel free to interrupt me in any moment, ask questions, bring comments. Also, people uh, in the Zoom, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that we are a few and really have a conversation. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the first ever Lancet Commission on History of Medicine. Lancet, as you know, has become the most prestigious medical journal in the world last year, where it bypassed the New England Journal of Medicine and Impact Factor. It's not because of us, I think. It happened before it, the report was published. And uh, it has this uh, modality of uh, convening commissions to tackle meaningful issues in medicine and in healthcare. Uh, by now, I think there have been at least 70 that uh, uh, got the reports published and are ongoing 10 of, 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 15, of 15 as we speak. Uh, one was about depression, one on diabetes, one on global warming and health results. And we had the uh, honor of being the first one on history of medicine. Um, I will move straight to the next slide. Before we go into the report itself, I think I have to, in a way of a, a disclosure, Full disclosure. I just to minimize the, sure. those things. Please. Better. 
That's okay. I will read to you what you are missing because of this uh, uh, shadow. I, I first of, that, of all would like to dedicate this talk to my grandparents, my namesake. I'm called Shmuel Pinchas after my uh, murdered grandparents and grandfathers who were murdered in the Holocaust. Uh, Shmuel, my maternal grandfather, uh, and Pinchas, my paternal grandfather. They both perished in Mauthausen in Austria in the winter of 44. And of course, uh, this is a very important uh, part of who I am and what, what my identity is. And I also uh, want to zoom, uh, zoom back into current events, which are also part of my identity. Uh, you are all aware of what happened on October 7 and what is still going on. And I would like to mention Ayelet Tarnin. Uh, she was killed together with another young person from the community in which I live, which is a 300 strong uh, village. These two kids in the 20s went to a music festival and on October 7th, they were killed, Ayala Tarnin and Segev Kijner. Uh, Eli Margalit is a distant relative who was murdered on the same day in Kfar Aza. And his daughter, Nili, who is a nurse, was taken hostage, but thank goodness she was released uh, in the first hostage release that happened, and that I hope will be repeated soon. So I was bringing this up to make sure that you know who I am, where I come from, uh, what my identity is, but now I want you to imagine me taking my identity hat off, the personal identity, and putting the professional identity hat on. And from now on, I will speak about the professional side. Of course, you remember where I come from, and if you have any questions about that, I, I will be very happy to answer them. So why do we need to speak about things that happened 80 years ago and are long gone and for many long forgotten? Uh, of course, there is the whole issue of crimes against humanity and genocide that the Nazis uh, performed. But what is central to us here today is to remember that medicine has professionals, the institutions or the associations were uh, instrumental and in certain aspects having a decisive role in what happened. Uh, this is very well documented and this is why we can really uh, research it. In the picture you see uh, Eugen Fischer, uh, one of the initiators of the uh, racial hygiene laws who experimented in World War I in Africa on uh, uh, natives for all kinds of uh, uh, racial uh, research, uh, some of it of course, was highly unethical, became even more unethical during the war, and this is why we need to talk about that. Having said that, uh, in this point or other points in time when I talk about this or other people talk about this, always the issue of what about other genocides come up. So I just want to uh, make clear that there is no competition of suffering of uh, different uh, uh, atrocities that happened. But what we need to uh, emphasize here is that this is practically the only genocide that was medicalized. All the other genocides, horrible as they were, were uh, movements of uh, that of of uh, governments, of uh, leaders, of populations that did great harm to others, but the involvement of medicine or physician was either non-existent or no coming. Here we have a different story. There is a list, extensive list of medical crimes, including having involvement in the Holocaust, the genocide of uh, European Jewry and other vulnerable populations, and this is why it's uh, relatively unique. The picture, again, is a faculty meeting 
in the medical school in Vienna. Uh, you know, the Nazis uh, were invited to Austria on, on the Anschluss in 1938, and all academia and healthcare were Nazified almost uh, in an instant. Uh, two thirds of the faculty of the medical school were sent home. Afterwards, they were sent to uh, more terrible places. And this is how it looks like in fac faculty meetings. The dean was a perfect Nazi. He became the rector later on. He is the, the one who uh, authored the Pernk of Atlas. I don't know if we have time to go there, but uh, this is how it looks like under the Nazis. And uh, as I said, because we have such an extensive and extreme uh, documentation, we can uh, do proper research, get all the evidence that we can. And actually the report has a very uh, sizable summary of all the relevant history of medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust based on, on this documentation. And having said that, uh, we may gain recognition of patterns and common roots with other histories of medical abuse and oppression and the recognition of the shared humanity of all sufferers. I'm here because uh, Zohar is taking a group of students to Khrabin, which is a story I always knew about vaguely, but since you invited me here and gave me, sent me a book to read, which I'm reading as uh, we have three moments here, I start to realize the, the magnitude and the whole of the 731 unit and the rest of the Japanese unit in Manchuria and elsewhere, uh, which is another, and the documentation there, by the way, exists as well, but was really out of sight and out of mind for many years, and what you're doing is therefore so important. So all the things that I've just said came also to the attention of Richard Dalton, the editor-in-chief of The Lancet. Uh, Tim, you heard the inside story, how it happened. And uh, in uh, late 1920, uh, 2020, uh, Richard decided that it's time to uh, commission a commission on Holocaust, uh, on medicine and Holocaust during our deliberations we changed the name to Medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust. So if you need it, we can explain it later. And uh, the, the announcement went out in the papers that you see here. In uh, the Holocaust, International Holocaust Memorial Day in January 21. And three, we had three tasks in the commission. I, by the way, uh, was uh, invited to be one of the three co-chairs of the commission. It was me, I'm a family physician and a medical educator with special interest in this subject. The other was Sabine Hildenbrand, who is an MD anatomist from Harvard. And the third was uh, uh, Volker Rolke, a psychiatrist, medical historian from East Germany, who later has to step down and was replaced by Harry Czech, who is a medical historian from Vienna. And we were tasked with three missions. The first, uh, to collect and document evidence-based history of what happened with medicine, Nazism, and the Romans. The second, to extract implications from the evidence-based history for now and the future. And the third, to translate the implications into education. What should we, and if yes, how and what, uh, move all this history and its implication into teaching of health professionals and many, many others. And the result is the uh, report. It was uh, published on November 8th. It's available online. You can download it, it's open. Uh, it comes with an appendix, uh, which has additional features I will speak about in a minute. And together they constitute uh, a roadmap on how to move from the history to the implication 
to education. We were 20 commissioners and uh, we invited uh, young physicians, nurses, scientists to join us in a competitive uh, fashion. And it, we elected 15 of the applicants to serve as our sounding board. Yes, as us elderly, more experienced, maybe a bit dinosaurs needed to make sure that we are not talking to ourselves. So we invited these 15 young people. I see that you're smiling, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, uh, they really uh, added a very important dimension because we were 20 people from six countries, six countries, but it was Germany, US, Israel, Spain, Czechoslovakia, Austria. They added Japan, China, Indonesia, India, Kenya, as you can see on the map. So uh, we can say that the Commission and the Student Advisory Council uh, was diverse enough to tackle this domain uh, in, in, in an effective way and also address the issue, how do you bring the message, this kind of education to communities, to populations that are not the usual ones, that have not been exposed or aware of what happened in the Holocaust, yet may uh, intellectual, uh, uh, educationally benefit from it. So we ended up 40 nations, and we felt that we have enough diversity of beliefs and politics uh, to do justice to the subject. So as, as you already know, we looked for historical evidence. Uh, and we looked for the implications. And we looked for what kind of teaching can result. And one of the first things that we uh, realized is that we need a new construct in order to frame the educational message, which we call history informed professional identity formation. This might be a Chinese to you, or sorry, this might be a, not a, a foreign language. For, for me, Chinese is the most foreign language that you can have. I don't know what it will be for you. Uh, and I, I will explain later what we mean by that. And uh, we will, when we started the corona, broke out, so uh, we had to change the way we operated. Instead of getting together physically in Germany, we got together on Zoom. But then when the corona went down a little, we met in Jerusalem, in Vienna, and we brainstormed around the globe and around the clock. This is a picture from the meeting in Jerusalem, and you can see people from Japan and from the US and from Czechoslovakia, uh, on the Zoom, uh, with an Israeli, an Austrian director of Review, you, uh, Matt from Denver, Colorado, uh, doing the job. And this is the list of implications. I'm sure that you can grasp all of them in one look. It's an easy list, but uh, don't try even. Uh, we worked on it extensively. There are over 100 implications that we have identified, but in the end, uh, we, we condense them. We realized, first of all, that the history of medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust is relevant to every field of medicine and healthcare. It has messages, it has uh, ways of thinking, helping to solve problems for every uh, field in medicine, and we can uh, debate this if you want to and that it is relevant to the perception and debates that we're having today and about the future uh, in health professions and for the public. And we identified by consensus five key implications. Uh, here they are in a nutshell, and let's go over them one by one because they are key implications. 
The first, the atrocities committed that cannot be explained by the fact that the perpetrators were, for example, German or Austrian. It wasn't the result of a certain group of people. We are sure that uh, the outcome of the corrupt moral agency is an expression, an extreme expression of potential dangers that exist in modern medicine in general. And actually, some of the underlying mechanism for these potential dangers has to do with the scientific revolution, with medicine becoming much more laboratory-based, with the, the look for objectivity, for creating more of a distance between patient and uh, health professional, and due to the fact that healthcare has an inherent propensity for abuse of power in it. When you're a physician and health, health professional, you have a lot of power, you can pronounce death, you can influence new life, you can commit a patient, etc., etc., etc. And there are moments in which even the most moral health professional uh, get challenges to the uh, effort to avoid abuse of power. And we can discuss this more afterwards. But you can see how this can be translated into an educational intervention. The second one is also very important. When you study the history and its implications, it's become very clear and contrary to what you will find in the textbook. If you read Harrison, which is like the Bible for uh, most physicians all over the world. There is a first chapter about to be a physician, which states that the core value of medicine are robust, rock-like. I think this, the, the evidence in history of World War II shows, and afterwards, that core values and the ethics of medicine and health care are very fragile. If you apply enough force or you apply enough limitations, they are at risk. And the worst example is uh, what happened with Nazis. Thus, they need to be protected and they need constant assessment and reinforcement. It's not something that uh, is etched in stone and it's there and it will protect you for life. By the way, the Nazis had a moral code. If you thought that they were depraved and ignorant of uh, what we call a moral code, they were the first one in the world to have an ethical code of medicine that was established in the late 20s, early 30s for a reason. They had a catastrophe with vaccination. But when the Nazis came to power, they did something very simple. They said the, the code applies to everybody except those who are not Aryans. So yeah, once you do something like this, you get the opposite of morality. The third key implication, and it's very important to uh, spell it out, uh, I would say it, we would like our health professionals to be courageous, to resist when they are encounter things that they think have problems with morality, and that they will speak up when necessary. Now, the uh, senior physicians here, I'm not sure they will be very happy that their juniors will become uh, practitioners like this, but I think that in the end of the day, we know that in order to keep our profession clean and moral, this is the only way to make sure that every health professional has moral agency, conscience, and is not afraid to speak up when they encounter a problem. And uh, we, uh, we would like, I'll come back to it in a minute, that during edu in education, we will help our learners realize that there are potential abuses of trust, of power, and of authority in healthcare, 
and they have to be prevented. And whenever one is encountering them, they need to stand up. Am I making myself clear? The fourth one is, I think, uh, very understandable as well. Health professionals has particular responsibility. It's not just as a general citizen. As a health professional in fighting anti-Semitism, racism, and all forms of discrimination. Racism, anti-Semitism, discrimination is bad for health. And as a health professional, one of your duties, one of your competencies needs to be fighting them. And the last one, where was it lost? Let's go back to the... The last one is that whenever we pursue scientific knowledge, it has to be always after we have made sure that human rights have been uh, observed. Like what we saw in Manchuria, in Sarbin, what we saw in Block 10 in Auschwitz is human rights completely erased, neglected, put aside, the welfare of the victims completely ignored, not to speak about cruelty and abuse. And of course, now we have the codes to prevent from it and all the checks and balances, but we need to make sure that we remember this all the time. Okay, so there are now a few constructs that are central to the way we look at medical education, and let's review them. Professionalism in your curriculum now, and you have a strength of professionalism I've learned in the last three days. And of course, it is now uh, maybe one of the most important pillars of how you try to uh, make health professionals grow and become practitioners. And it's the skills, values, and behavior that are expected of a healthcare professional at any given time. Uh, the way to evaluate it is through competence. We are not uh, happy just with the, uh, how shall I say, it, um, kind of vague spiritual definitions of professionalism. We want to observe behavior. We should make sure that our learners are competent in their professional skills. And uh, almost every curriculum now in residency, in medical school, in nursing school, is now uh, written with end competencies in mind that can be evaluated. However, uh, most medical educators will tell you that the major aim of medical education is professional identity formation. What do we mean by that? Uh, Tim, when you and I went to medical school, they taught us the trade. They taught us how to talk to patients, how to examine them, how to reason clinically, how to do procedures. And then they threw us into the water and we swam or sank. At least the two of us swam. And uh, we became physicians. Nobody spoke to us about what being a physician means. But I'm sure you had the same experience that when you looked at it as you were before entering the tunnel of medical education, and how you were when you came out of the, at the end of residency, you were the same person. You acquired an identity of a physician. It was done implicitly, not explicitly. And in a way, it was haphazard in the way that it formed. So in the last decade, we realized we have to be explicit about identity formation. We have to give learning experiences that will shape identity, hopefully in a positive way. And we think that the domain I'm talking about is an unparalleled platform for exactly that you realize what was the worst case scenario of your profession ever, and hopefully you integrate it into your identity and know what not to do, and what to be mindful about not doing. Okay, 
what I'm going to present to you now is not new. It was actually uh, published 20, 30 years ago in, in other works of academia and 14 years ago in another Lancet Commission report. In 2010, there was a Lancet Commission report on medical education, which among other things spoke a lot about professional identity formation, but then said that medical education happens on three levels, an informative level, a formative level, and a transformative level. Informative is again going back to what I said about Tim and me, how we learn. We got all the information that you need in order to become a physician. Somebody else got it in a nursing school, uh, etc. At the same time, we were also formed. We went through a socialization, but this one wasn't uh, uh, explicit education. It happened. And I probably believe that both you and I were at some time during the, our trajectory also transformed. We were going through stages of development that made qualitative difference. So now we are actually summoning medical education to take this as a description of, the, of a model of medical education and make it part of the curriculum so that we will teach knowledge and skills in informative stage. We will make sure the socialization is happening and going in the right way. And we will make sure also that our graduates are also not just doing the job, not just doing the trade, but also are mindful of the system, of the, the health of the population, and that they see part of their job to be enlightened change agents, which is a completely different dimension that I believe most physicians and nurses in the world not now will not say that they see it as part of the job yet. And uh, our report supplies a background for all the three stages. And we believe that the contrast construct of history and foreign professional information helps us to develop along this way. We'll come back to it in a minute. So I'm now to the third mission of the commission, the medical education goals of the report. Uh, this were uh, uh, formulated in order to develop an, an educational approaches, promote ethical conduct, moral development, and form formation of professional identity that will be based on compassion. Of course, it's not just knowledge, it's not just knowing the facts, it has to do also with your inner state, with your emotional state, with your compassion. So, and, and so if, if you will ask me, what are we teaching? When we teach about medicine, Nazism, the Holocaust, I will say we are teaching empathy. We are teaching compassion. We are teaching the right approach for the other, even though you may think otherwise at first glance. We believe that learning, and we still will need to uh, prove it, and I will tell you a little about how, that this history supports the formation of morally courageous, resilient professionals that will be better equipped because, you know, with the omics and molecular biology and the technology and all the outstanding options that are now at the hands of health professionals, the moral challenges are growing exponentially. And we need better equipped transitioners in order to face these challenges. And we also need a professional community that will have a greater capacity to shape and support this across of its members. And we believe that this is a, maybe a unique platform for achieving that. A short digression into the current medical education paradigms. One central one is competency-based medical education. I mentioned it a little when I spoke about competencies. This is the CanMed's uh, flower of uh, TBME, which actually tells us that in order to be 
a medical expert, you need an integrated and seamless uh, combination of communicator, professional, scholar, health advocate, leader, and collaborator, and that the competencies do not derive from what the profession says, which is the way curricula were formed always. Uh, we, the elders of medicine, sat together and we said, this is what you need to learn. Now we want to, to change the balance and we actually look for the public and society to tell us what they need. Of course, we will also supply our professional knowledge and this is where the competences will be come from. The other one is what I already mentioned, is the informative, formative, transformative paradigm, just to reiterate, the informative is about knowledge and skill and informs experts. The formative is about identity and it forms professionals. And the transformative, as I said already, is developing leadership attributes and hopefully producing change agents. We have uh, adopted these uh, paradigms into the report and all our propositions are based on these uh, prisms. Back to history informed professional identity formation. It is use of knowledge and reflect and knowledge of and reflection on the history of the profession to build moral agency among professionals, thereby enhancing the capacity to serve as stewards of our shared professional values. Or, going a bit, zooming in, critical reflection. So, Once history-informed professional identity formation kicks in, we expect critical reflection on what professional values and priorities ought to be, never blindly accepting existing professional structures and cultures or proposed changes to this, but to critically scrutinize them, examine their origins, assess the alignment between one's personal values and those of the profession, and examine goals for areas of weakness. I know it's a tall order, but when you don't follow this kind of order, trouble comes. So, more about the educational method. When you do this learning, it provokes reflection on contemporary challenges that demand moral courage, but it also addresses a very relatively new, at least to be recognized, issue of uh, uh, ethics and morality in health, the one of moral distress and moral injury. Uh, actually, it was a combination of the war in Afghanistan and COVID that made us realize that many health professionals, when they are in, in dire straits, such as war, combat, or a, a terrible pandemic are challenged to degrees that are becoming intolerable between their beliefs and the possibilities that what they need to do are. And in COVID, it was an epidemic. People were falling apart, not just because it was very painful to see people succumbing in hours in front of their eyes, but also because they had to take very heavy decisions to intubate, to isolate, to not allow family into the ICU with dying patients. That it, it created a lot of very uh, serious uh, challenges to continue functioning. This is moral distress and in some circumstances it evolved into moral injury. People um, were burnt out, could not continue. Uh, you know, they were, they, they, we lost a lot of manpower to COVID. People left their professions 
insignificant. But more, what is more important, moral distress can end in moral injury and cause burnout. And morally distressed, injured, and burnt out practitioners dehumanize the patients. And this is why we need to pay much more attention to the moral education of the health professional, both in order that it will have moral agency, but also to defend him, to prepare him for a world where he's, he will be morally distressed. It will be a big challenge for him. And in many places now, uh, there are surveys of burnout to make sure that uh, your practitioners are healthy, there are interventions, there are ways to detect, and uh, a lot of the interventions are offered to foster resilience. Uh, all what I said until now is in the report, but the report also has an appendix. The appendix is trying to, in the report, we, we avoided using too much jargon. We didn't want to scare the readers. Uh, but in the appendix, we went deeper into educational language, and we have it's uh, it's not in the it's not in the brochure. You have to access it online. It's it's open, but this is just the report itself. Uh, we have a, a primer on medical education that is really a roadmap. It's like leading you by the hand how to move from your desire to introduce teaching about medicine, Holocaust and medicine. Uh, medicine, Nazism in the Holocaust, to making it happen in a pedagog pedagogically uh, uh, up-to-date fashion, in, in a ped pedagogy that will be the most effective. Lectures are okay, but if you will do things beyond lectures, it will be more effective. If you do uh, in interactive teaching, if you take people to museums or to sites, are being included. If you'll have uh, mock trials, the more the pedagogy will be more uh, uh, innovative, you have a better chance of making it effective. And this primer speaks about design, speaks about pedagogy, and speaks about assessment. If we have time, we can talk about assessment as well. It has a list during the, in the report, the, and in the appendix together, we have 45 case studies. Uh, short stories of all the aspects of what happened in this period that uh, an educator can take and turn into an educational intervention. You want to speak about uh, uh, eugenics. You know, eugenics was a movement that all the racial laws and racial hygiene came out of. There would be a story about the pioneers of Eugenics, you can take it, you can give it to your learners, they will get the content they need, and then they can move into a discussion, a, a, an intervention, uh, a workshop about it. So 45 stories that are sampling the history and the implications are provided, and they can make life easier for the educator. We also have a roster of 18 syllabi that we have collected around the world that still that already exist and do justice to this uh, subject matter that you can either copy or be inspired of. And finally, there's also a glossary uh, for those who are more historically inclined in, with translations of German terms that are. You can also design your approach in, in different uh, levels of depth and width. You can just give one short talk like I'm giving you today. You can do a, a workshop of four hours, or you can do a full semester, or you can even spread the domain over a full medical school. We are now moving in one or two establishment to have during a six year medical school, two, uh, classes a year over the six years that are uh, rippling with uh, content. For example, when they do anatomy, there is a class about anatomy in the third life. Public health, we speak about the Holocaust of the public, the war, public health intervention trauma. 
we speak about the, the, the post-trauma of survivors. Uh, infectious diseases, there's a lot to speak about what happened from the infectious disease point of view in the ghettos and the camps. So that we make this living history that applies to, to uh, practical subjects, and we believe that this will make it even more effective. Finally, we have also, we thought that it will end by 10 commandments, but we got to 11. We weren't careful. Uh, recommendations, educational recommendations. And I'm going to read them to you one by one. No, no. Don't be alarmed, we'll just pick a few. Uh, so for example, uh, Use the history of medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust to emphasize the unique opportunities and responsibilities of health professionals in protecting vulnerable populations. Okay? Uh, recognize the value of the informative, formative, transformative value, etc. Create experiential learning opportunities, including visits to historical sites or museums, when possible, and historical case studies that represent real life approaches to learn. And support holding both individual health professionals and professional organizations accountable for critical reflection on the core values of the profession. You had an accreditation here, I heard today not long ago, the medical school. Our vision is that checking how this domain features in the curriculum will become part of accreditation because we believe that it's so important to uh, foster uh, better health professionals and health people. Uh, there are three I, I'm, I'm, I'm near the end of my talk. There are three outcomes that we are looking for. Having said all this, one, we want our learners to recognize the potential for abuse of power and six ways to prevent it for themselves. Two, we want them to demonstrate. And you, you can see that I speak in competencies language. These are uh, verbs that can be observed. Did he recognize? Does he demonstrate? Or she? Moral agency and courage, speaking up when necessary. And we went one step further. Remember we said uh, we have a specific responsibility to fight against racism, anti-racism, and discrimination. We go one step further. We think that health professionals, and you can see how this is relevant also to events that are occurring now, to incorporate prevention of crimes against humanity and genocide to the medical ethos and to medical competence. Not only fight anti-Semitism and discrimination, but also try to detect, prevent, and care for these uh, terrible crimes, which doesn't seem uh, medicine stuff, but as like anti-Semitism, like discrimination, they have dire health consequences. And if we can detect, prevent, and care for them, it's our responsibility. I'll stop here. The one or two more things that maybe will come up, but I will be open now for questions. That was wonderful. Uh, let me start, so a few questions, but let me start with one. Taking it, disconnecting from the content. Huh? So you told me that it took you three years to write this book. So as a, this is a bad, budding academic, um, not, 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 maybe not in your case, but I'm sure in the case of your collaborators, there was um, pressure on them to produce Articles. Uh, so you, you work on something for a month or two, you send it away, you forget about it. 
the new workers of the union and take upon yourself a project like this can be difficult. Right? You have to forego all of your other obligations. So just I want you to know um, how you manage to do that. So it's a huge sacrifice um, from your personal life or your professional life. How did you manage to do that? <laughs> uh, well, I will disclose that uh, this subject really took over my life. Uh, but not in the sense that you are asking me about. I'm uh, beyond promotion. I don't need promotion anymore. So this issue was not uh, a factor. But just to let you know, this is my most impact factor loaded publication. I'm the first author. And I can get, if I was 20 years younger, I would get full professorship because of that. But as I said, at the age of 76, it's not very important. Now, also, Sabine, the other co-chair, uh, was not concerned with the promotion. Herwig was concerned, and also some of the commissioners. And they continued with, with their other endeavors. And we tried to help each other. Each one was uh, chipping in when the, the going became rough. Now, I, I about three or four years ago, I was sure that I will not write another grant and I will not need to write another paper. So first of all, we wrote the report. Second of all, there are now three new papers. One was uh, accepted uh, three days ago. Uh, one is in review, almost accepted, and one is in review that sprang out of it, not because I want promotion, because there were things that had to go out and and be read and make uh, the impact. Um, uh, ha having said that, going into a commission might be counterproductive for uh, somebody who needs uh, to beef up their CV. But I think having been on a commission, first of all, is prestigious. Second of all, it's a publication. And third of all, you can get a lot of uh, uh, impulses and ideas and collaborators to do better and do more meaningful things afterwards. Um, is that your answer? Okay. Like a lot of common challenges that I have teaching at a very young junior high school student. Like when I was ten years old or even younger, the first time I can teach like like in a play where um they don't really listen to it, and sometimes they might. A very small portion of that don't feel relate to the topic of ethics. And some of them I think that like in the way that it's gone the way down the medical school training, they wouldn't put too much access to the ethics on professions or professions. So like one of the strategies that I adopt is to talk about the medical atrocity, you know, what would heal them or adequate related historic example to help them to see like how humanity Build us. So one of the like questions that I have for you is like, what sort of your like um, journey to um, teaching Korea? Maybe you share your um, good practice to how you met and you can learn and teach um, ethics. Thank you. It's, it's of course a, a very important question. You know, in medical schools uh, all over the world, we are teaching the things that requires the highest maturity early on. And it's it's a problem. You want to teach ethics, you want to teach communication, you want to teach empathy, you want to teach um, ethical uh, decision-making, uh, you want to teach uh, um, compassion, uh, uh, end of life, uh, um, et cetera. And, you have 18 or 19 year olds that uh, have never been exposed to this 
uh, part of life. So there are a lot of questions on, on the timing. Uh, I will submit to you that what we probably need is to move a lot of the uh, humanistic and ethical teaching into the clinical years and into the residency. Once you are on the world, every day, there will be moral challenges, there will be moral distress, and you will not need to teach. You will need to almost counsel. The people will come with what happened to them yesterday at night, they had to do a CPR on a patient. They feel it was futile, the family was on top of them, they are completely chattered. The group sits around, the, the, the learner tells the story, you don't have to teach, it's, you, have, you, you facilitate the discussion. But in the current situation, uh, the, I think the most important thing is to find a connection to the world of the learner. So if I need to teach uh, ethics in Israel, I don't know the context here well enough. Uh, tomorrow morning. Unfortunately, we have very pertinent ethical issues happening in our, in our life. So I will probably ask my learners, some of whom just came back from uh, being soldiers in Gaza, uh, what kind of ethical problems have you encountered? We start from there. I don't know what, I hope they will not have an equivalent like this here, but I'm sure there are. I'm sure there was some health scandal here in the last months, or uh, some, uh, 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 somebody was sued for malpractice and it made uh, some noise. So look for the local, timely, relevant connection and start from there. Because if you start uh, saying, telling them, let's talk about end of life, uh, you don't have a partner to, to talk about. Uh, one other angle, I'm not sure it will work here, it works, for example, in the United States, is to get help from popular uh, media, such as uh, television. Uh, you take an ER episode, they will, you take a Dr. House episode, they get connected. So you really have to, how shall I say it, be, be strategic in the way that you, both in what and the timing. So following on that, so, you, right, so you, you usually focus on education on the first of all, then the intern, then uh, resident. The thing is, most of our careers, uh, healthcare provider is not medical school and residents where we are attending or nursing staff, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Well, first of all, from your experience, and I, I suspect that we all can assist me to answer, usually that part gets neglected, right? And also to, to, to ask me whether that's the right? uh, but how do we prevent that from being infected? With the majority of our career, how do we, you know, acknowledging that what, what you presented is so important, um, learning about Holocaust and about Japan and other atrocities, other instances, how do we cover that neglected area, which is really the majority of our career? So, for example, in the um, most medical schools now in Israel, uh, we introduce very early on a few uh, approaches. First, early ex exposure. The students get to see patients sometimes on the first day in the medical school, I told you about. Uh, and they continue to see them. We don't want them to uh, to experience what Tim and I experienced a few years ago, when, when we went through the pre-clinical years, we learned on the science, and suddenly the fourth year, uh, we were reached on patients. 
We want them to, to understand what patients are so that when they learn science, that they don't learn it for science sake, they learn it in service of the patients that they've already seen. One thing. The second thing, we uh, require from them to learn clinical skills very early. Sometimes in the first semester, sometimes in the second, they start to learn communication skills, start to learn clinical examination, clinical reasoning, and they get to practice it first in simulation and then on patients. Immediately, they will encounter moral issues. You interview a patient, every second or third patient will, will bring with his or her story something that's also morally challenging. So, you ask them to document. So, they write down like an admission kind of a, a, a chart, and you say, once you finish the, the admission report, write a reflection. What did you feel when you spoke to this patient? Uh, how did it affect you? What uh, were your emotions? Were you afraid? Were you happy? Were you repulsed? What are you taking from this encounter so that the next time that you will see a patient, there will be a positive difference? Now, why is this so important? This is why we are doing the reflective writing workshop. I had the, the, the fortune of preparing uh, seasoned practitioners to become clinical teachers. In a new medical school, uh, in, in peripheral hospitals, that were not doing uh, student teaching in the north of Israel. So we uh, uh, convened a, a faculty development event. And one of the first things that we did, we asked them to sit down and write for 10 minutes. We said, think about something that uh, preoccupies you, that happened to you, that uh, you might wake up at night uh, thinking about it, and then just write about it. These were practitioners that were 20 years, 25 years, 15 years, in in, uh, in career, invariably, half to a third brought up an event of either an error or losing a patient that happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that they had nobody to speak to about, and they are still 20 years later, have not been cured from this injury. So we are trying to teach the students, don't keep anything in your stomach. Be reflective. In, in, I was uh, on a sabbatical in the States. Uh, this is a four years school. In the first year, we were going to a, an assisted living facility with our students three or four times a year. Each one was assigned a, a, a resident. And they interviewed them, they examined them, they befriended them. One day we come with the group to an assisted living facility. And after a few minutes, I see one of the students crying. I come gently and he says, my resident died a week ago. He came to the bed, he expected to find the, the, the resident and continue and suddenly he encountered end of life. So we comforted him, we spoke with him, but then he wrote a reflection. Uh, I'll send you the, the paper he wrote about. It's called uh, Losing My Elderly Patient. He wrote a reflection. He received feedback from me and from another faculty. And one of the things I wrote to him in my feedback, when, I, when my first patient died, I had nobody to speak to. So you're very lucky that it's a patient that you befriended for education. You weren't responsible clinically for him yet. And you got the privilege of 
processing would happen. So this is where I think we can make this. Thank you so much for your piece of sharing. Um, I'm also uh, very interested in history of the Second World War. So I've been in Bahau, the largest town a few years back. So um, just maybe it's just three comments, or I, I don't know whether it's a question or my own reflection. The number one is about um, history. So I I understand that many of these uh, historical records were being seized by, uh, destroyed by Texas for uh, wealth, and then also seized by Allied armies. So how could you confirm uh, whether the historical records that are accessible nowadays are the true version of what we have? Because I, I know that there may be some exaggeration and different versions uh, to that degree, I, I'm unusual, but uh, I found it quite difficult to come up with a true ghost, unlike chem chemistry, but in history, I always arguments between different camps, different parts. So, how did you overcome this? This is the first question. The second question is uh, I read out whether ethics is ever teachable, to be honest. If you Want to teach it, you can teach it within 10 minutes because the basic principles are open. But the only issue is uh, whether students can. Well, if you ask all the students, actually, most adult students help you do it, even without any, any preparation, unlike other factual kind of uh, education. So, uh, so I agree with Soha that uh, we should bring the students back to, to the camp, to the sites. That, because I was really shocked I, when I saw what happened, I went to the gas chamber and you can still feel the horror even after 18 years. So it, it was quite shocking. So I, I strongly recommend if we have resources, we should bring the students to the sites to visit and let them feel and then start to And And the first thing is, um, can, can I? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I don't forget. Uh, I can go back to another question. But let me, so the, the the first thing, I uh, wasn't a big fan of historians, and uh, I thought that they are kind of wishy washy, and who knows what they are doing exactly. But the experience I had in the commission is that to find out they are serious scholars, and they have a method that uh, creates evidence. Yeah. I'm not a historian, so I cannot give you more uh, details, but everything that is published in our report was checked by many scholars, and only when there was a consensus and, re and, and references that are strong enough, it was stated. So I'm not worried about this. The second question is, is much more uh, in my uh, backyard. Uh, can we teach ethics? Um, you know, uh, I'm Jewish, and we say that Jews, when you ask them a question, they answer by another question. So brace yourself for my question. How do you teach empathy? For me, I think we can't teach it. I thought that you would say. If you only learn empathy, then you will learn. That's, that's a great way to do it. Uh, I was facing all my professional life. I'm 46 years in practice, and you can add seven years before the medical school. I was told all the way, now I'm being told less, you can't teach empathy. You can't teach patient-doctor yeah. relationship. You can teach ethics. And I back to this. Not only you can teach it, even uh, dinosaurs like me can still be taught to be empathic, moral, and have better patient-doctor communication. 
Uh, and we have enough evidence about it. If you're interested, I can send references. The way to do it is not to talk about it. It's to practice it and get feedback and reflect. And I think we are solidly now in being able to teach it. But I want to say something more. You said the right answer for an ethical problem is very simple. There are four principles. We apply the principles, we get an answer. There is only one problem. In reality, it doesn't work. Okay, first of all, there are always conflicts between the principles. And second of all, this, this was so obvious during Corona. This is so obvious when you're a physician in combat. This is so obvious when a patient has certain values and you have different values in the family are fighting about three other things. Uh, so the basic fact to teach a health professional, and I'm quoting Arthur Kleiman here, Aaron uh, here, is to realize that moral reality is always with a gap from the moral idea. A day in the life of a physician, family physician, what do I do? I take care of the running nose and sore throat. You have 10 to 15 moments in which you have moral challenges. Am I being compassionate? Am I really doing the best thing for the patient context? Am I taking everything in consideration? The fact that I'm too tired, how does it affect the way I'm being a uh, professional? To be a formed or transformed health professional, you have to live with this fact that your moral reality will always be with a gap to your moral ideas. And not try to be ideal because it will destroy you. But if you reflect and if you consult with your colleagues and with your mentors and with your patients and with your learners, you can develop and become ever more better with getting to what is uh, good enough, and I'm not saying the best, the good enough moral answer. And you can find situations in which for the same data, you will, you will take a decision and it's opposite because of the context of the patient. So, so I didn't like history like I told in the beginning, and I was hating ethics. Whenever I was meeting with the, the SECs, I felt that they are all the time moving hot air, nothing comes out. But then I learned from Kleiman and others that there is a way to make it practical. I have one, uh, one point you made here, that is, uh, I think that it's a missing piece of our understanding of uh, why people behave as such. I, I, I'm really impressed by the mission. So that's uh, the faculty who were uh, doing that uh, characteristic posture in the leader. So I guess if you can travel back in time and ask each of of most of these doctors uh, what they behave actually was not they wanted to behave. They were under huge political pressure. If you need to survive at that time, in that particular time, you have under that system. You have to be this. So I think, um, is it the, so, the, so the, so evidence, the evidence is against all this? Yeah. They were asked. And most of them did it because they believed it's the right thing. They were not forced to do it. Yeah, to a certain degree. Uh, but I read out that um, how free are uh, were their souls in making such a decision? Because when you are under this political system, with this culture, with these kind of beliefs, with these kind of um, you know uh, organizations. They're just part of the machine. It has its effect. So can we teach our students or ourselves to be independent, to be 
not so being affected by surroundings. Because I believe that that's my own personal opinion. Not all of them were acting out free. Not all of them their own ideas. Some of them were false. Not deliberately uh, by someone's order that you have to do it in order to survive the system. Well, I, um, there is a documentary uh, in which uh, one of the physicians in Auschwitz is interviewed. If you're interested, I can try and look up the link. And when he is asked uh, about how he felt there, he said, uh, I felt very good. I was doing the right thing. Mengele was the nicest person. And uh, the interview is uh, 35 years after the end of the war. And he has no regret and no second thoughts. And most of the Nazi physicians were like this. Uh, first of all, I hope you know that 7% of German physicians joined the SS. This was completely wrong. Many other professions uh, joined this as lawyers, architects, etc. None of the professions was more than 0 0.5. The physicians in Germany had a special affinity with Nazis. That's one of the historical facts. There are many reasons to it. If you read the report, there is an explanation. It has to do with what happened after World War I, and there was a crisis of the uh, statue and compensation to German medicine. There were many reasons. There was also the traditional anti-Semitism that was very prevalent in uh, German medicine. But the physicians who didn't go with the flow, for example, uh, there was a time that you had to report patients for uh, the sterilization, patients who should not procreate according to the racial hygiene laws. Other times you had to report people whose life are not worthy of living for the T4 program for killing. Those who did not report, as there were many, had no repercussions. Nobody had to pay for not going with the flow, for not raising his hand in Heil Hitler, or not uh, joining the SS, some did it for uh, opportunities reason. Of course, there were many opportunities if you were, you were in the SS, or if you were part of the, the, the party men. 50% of German physicians became party members, with 20 only for teachers. There was a special affinity. This is the, and they were sure that they are doing the right thing that what they were doing was service to the German people and to humanity, that killing the Jews will benefit humankind tremendously. They even, when they uh, were killing people in the T4 program in gas chambers, the nurses and the physicians that were involved were interviewed to ask why they did it. They said this was because of caritas. They actually said, in other words, this was out of empathy for these poor people whose lives are not worthy of living. We help them out of the misery. So they had ethics, they had empathy. Of course, they had professional identity formation. They, they had schools for Nazi medicine, and they were very successful, much more than we did. Yeah. The, the people who graduated from the schools were permanent Nazi physicians. They had all this only in a world building. This is why we have to be so careful. So uh, I think a lot about these things. I'm not sure where to start, but I think my view is that I'm happy to walk the road with you for a while. 
and see whether the education works. But I have a lot of skepticism. For example, those Germans believed they were doing the right thing. Would any amount of education change that? I mean, we hope it would, but I am a bit skeptical. And so this is the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing that I'm, that I'm sad to say is, is that probably for most of the world, it's a Jewish problem. You know, Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and maybe Poles. So, I mean, don't bring it into my medical school. It's not my school. It's your problem. And I'm sad to say that I think that, I think that was a, a very, very strong prevailing mood amongst the Western nations that 70, 80 years ago was. Um, if you don't do education and what you do, you do just do nothing. Um, I mean, it's like the, the current uh, challenges in Israel in the last few months. Is education going to change you know, people from the other side view? Um, so I, I'm, I'm with you. I think I'm, I'm quite skeptical, but I think you have to do something. Um, I do have a different view on life, and so maybe I approach it uh, for for another occasion. But these are reflections, not so much uh, questions or challenges. It's just reflections. How does one make Hong Kong you uh, feel this is important for us? Um, now again, some countries have quite strong political. Uh, leadership that um, I understand Rex's view locally that you know you may not agree with it but you want to survive you better you know not think too too independently you just better go with the flow and that that's uh, quite common I can say now whether it's right or wrong but it is quite common and very difficult distract oneself, especially if one comes from this culture. You come from this culture. Or there's a from different people. You come from this culture. Certainly like different. So some reflections. Pick up whatever you want to. But, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Very challenging. And I, I don't pretend to have a an answer. I, I um, well, maybe illuminate a little as well. Um, I share your uh, point about who knows if it's going to be effective. We don't. We need to prove it. Uh, for that reason, we researched and uh, compiled an assessment text which is very elaborate. Uh, we are applying it now on a faculty development. We have an international course to uh, uh, train uh, uh, teachers of, of medicine, Nazism, and Necropos. Uh, there are 15 fellows from all over the world. Uh, it's a year-long course. And we have applied the package on them. It's a before and after. It has a knowledge test. It has a identity development measurement. It has reflection measurement. It has a um, moral sensitivity applied before and after. So when we meet again uh, after November, where we we're going to finish this course, maybe not right away, but a few months afterwards, I will tell you, did the assessment, first of all, fly? And did we make a difference? I don't know. You're absolutely right in being skeptical about it, and I'm as skeptical as you are, because it's a very fringe type of assessment. It's not the usual. By the way, for example, today, we are writing an OSCE case for medicine as in the Holocaust, it should also. So we are looking for 
how are we going to to prove our point? Because it's very nice to say what you believe in, and we are scientists. We need evidence. Uh, are we going to change the world? I don't think so. I I I'm a veteran of uh, multiple efforts to change the world. Uh, I was on the kibbutz, as an example, uh, and many others. I was one of the leaders of family medicine in Israel, trying to transform Israeli family medicine in medicine. We failed. Uh, I had uh, hundreds of uh, students and uh, residents and that I trained, are they uh, making a huge difference? They don't. So the, the odds that we will make a difference are slim. And it may have to do with the, the psychological uh, twist in my character that I'm still trying. But I'm, at least I'm not uh, the, the naive optimist that I always use, but I do have uh, still enough passion to, to go this way. Uh, so I agree with you. I, it's quite possible the majority of us, but you go after the minority. There are occasional people Know before, and they're but I think for them it's always fine. You do it even for the minority and, and for the majorities. You know, we're going to have to live it. We live in this society, this world. It's fine. But uh, there is definitely a changeable minority. And uh, yet yeah, we go out. And, and I also uh, appreciate the fact that you wrote uh, Gaza in. And I'm not going to be shy about this, even though it's, a, of course, a toxic issue. Um, Richard Horton, uh, and we spoke about this in dinner, uh, writes a lot of uh, uh, very strong rhetoric about the situation in Gaza and uh, how we, uh, the Israelis should uh, do different things, and but yet when we spoke about it, he said I was in Gaza. I saw the posters that uh, uh, indoctrinate everybody to become a shahid, and of course this is something you cannot fight against. You don't have a chance. And now, so about your question, can we change how the other side feels? I'm not even going there because I don't have any reason to. But I'm thinking about the physicians. Okay. Now, what do we do know about the physicians? Uh, we know that all the healthcare system and probably also the healthcare personnel. Uh, collude with Hamas. It's expressed in uh, evidence ways, such as uh, hostages were taken into the hospital and they were in prison there. We have evidence that one hostage was killed in the hospital. Uh, nurses uh, were jubilous when the hostages were, were brought in. Physicians were in the little medical care that was uh, offered was done in unacceptable ways. Uh, the hospitals themselves became a uh, uh, ammunition depots, uh, control centers, uh, terrorist attack launching sites. Uh, the perpetrators in October 7 came out of the hospital and came back with hostages and loot. Um, and you have now a, f a few hospital CEOs and officials who 
testified on record that they were employed by the Hamas, they got the salary from the Hamas, they got ranks from the Hamas, and so most of the personnel under the direction. Then there is the issue of uh, the, the humanitarian aid infrastructure in Gaza, which was mostly administered by UNRWA, it's the UN uh, uh, Refugee Authority that operates now 75 years, not only in Gaza, also in the West Bank, in Lebanon, and uh, supplies actually everything for those who are refugees from 1940. Some refute, uh, UNRWA employees participated in the massacre. Hostages were uh, imprisoned in apartments of teachers and physicians of UNRWA. And the uh, Hamas uh, server farm was found right under the UNRWA server farm in the headquarters in Gaza, with the cables that were connecting them severely recently. So this is this is my version of the facts. You may question it, and, and we can argue about. It. I I why I'm telling all this. I think this is a, this is the first time after the Holocaust where a medical establishment colludes with terrorists, with crimes against humanity, with genocide, and uh, there is no sign that anybody speaks about, neither uh, Richard Holt. And I'm waiting for the moment, which will arrive, where uh, the fighting will subside, and I will make it a point to go and meet with my Gaza colleagues and talk to them about this. And, and I suspect nothing much will happen, but I'm very interested to understand what is going on. Are you ready for something more? I want to show you a video. If you, we are producing now uh, educational interventions. So, uh, let me just share with you a short video expert. Can I? We are going live on June 1st with the pilot of a MOOC on medicine asking the Holocaust in English. We have one in Hebrew that is already running three years, and I will show you. It seems not working. Excerpt of a, of a okay, lecture. Please. 